and we certainly welcome you here tonight. Um, we, when Ted called me, Ted Rizal called me and he said, Bob, you don't open that meeting room in the winter. I said, well, don't have any reason to open it. <laughs> and he said, well, what if I gave you a reason? And I said, well, I'm, I'm certainly open. Well, when he told me the program, I said, we're open. <laughs> so I called Laura, we worked it all out, and we are thrilled to have this. Um, this facility, I'll tell you a little bit about, this was the gift to the people of Garrett County and the surrounding area from the Howard and Audrey Naylor family. And all we had to do was fill it and run it. And so far, three years down the road, we've filled it and we're running it. And programs like this were something, uh, um, programs like this is really what the Naylor family wanted. They wanted this used for community purposes, and we do that. We've had pizza parties up here. The Rotary had a box lunch up here. Um, we allow this to be used by the public with our, you know, control. And it is wonderful when we have a nice program like this, and we were thrilled. And I'm so glad we had such a turnout, as we have never opened in the winter before. I didn't know what to expect, <laughs> but I did know that all the Yacht Club members got an email. I checked on that, so I felt fairly secure, and it is really nice to have all of you here. Um, I've talked with Laura a couple times on the phone. I talked with Laura and Frederico here this past hour. They, I, we're going to enjoy, I know, we're going to enjoy. But Laura Smith, who spent a lot of time here on Deep Creek Lake, and I think Kevin, you were her in sailing instructor. Kevin is with us tonight, too, Kevin Rizal. And Frederico, we're honored from Argentina. And I told him, if only I knew, Saturday on the guest book downstairs is a man from Chile. <laughs> and if I just knew where he was staying in Garrett County, I'd have called and said, come on in here and meet a neighbor. But I didn't, you know, there was no address given. But Laura is going to present a program for us tonight that I've heard is wonderful. And uh, we'll all enjoy it. There are refreshments. There's coffee, water, cookies, anything you want. And uh, so I introduce Laura Smith and her husband, Frederico. And this must have been a wonderful journey. Now, I also asked her to tell you how she met her husband <laughs> and a few other things that relate to all of this. Okay? And if I forget to tell you, just ask me at the end, but I don't think I'll forget. I don't think so. How you met your husband? Yeah. <laughs> you can sit down for so thank you all very much for, for coming. Um, unfortunately, those of you who came to Garrett County to ski, I think I'll be showing you your only snow that you might see <laughs> during uh, the next few days. Um, so the talk tonight is really about the journey that Fede and I made to Antarctica on our sailboat. But before I dive into that, I'll just explain a little bit about me and why I'm actually here tonight and how we ended up going to Antarctica. Then I have a movie that I'll show, and then after that I'll talk a little bit about kind of what we're doing now, because our cool stuff doesn't really end at Antarctica, it's continuing. So as Bob said, I've spent a lot of time in Garrett County. Uh, we as a family spent our summers here, and now when I come back to the U.S., this is where I call home. Um, Bob started to steal my show, but uh, I actually learned how to it's sail. The first time. <laughs> <laughs> I learned how to sail here on Deep Creek Lake over at the Yacht Club, and um, I vivid. Kevin was asking if I remembered anything, and I said I vividly remember Monday mornings yeah. of sailing camp where you'd go out in the Optimus and the first thing you had to do was capsize. Yes. And mm -hmm. the idea of it was just, oh, I didn't like the idea of it, but once you're actually in the motion of capsizing and in the water, it's actually kind of fun. So um, Kevin traumatized me a few times on the Monday mornings. <laughs> I would dread those Monday mornings. Guilty. Yeah. <laughs> so I learned how to sail here on the lake. Um, then when I went off to college, I studied geological engineering, and now my kind of real job is I work on quite large vessels out at sea, making three-dimensional maps of the geology under the ocean floor. Which leads me to how I met my husband. 
So Fede's background is, he also has a background in sailing, which I'll talk about, and he went to school to join the Merchant Marine, so he has a master's unlimited captain's license, and he has driven uh, tankers, cargo ships, fishing vessels, and then the research vessels that I worked on. So we met out at sea, so it's kind of only fitting that the sea is where we continue our adventures. And actually, we live on our sailboat, so we don't actually have a house. We only have sailboats. So that's who I am. So now let's get started with Antarctica. So this is the lovely continent of Antarctica, and being a geologist, I always found it quite fascinating. And Fede, growing up as a sailor in Argentina, was never that far away and had this dream to go there. So in order to get to Antarctica, you more or less need three things. So the first thing is you need some way to get there, some mode of transportation. And there's two main ways of getting there, and that's either by boat or by plane. And there's kind of two main people who go there, and that's the tourists and the scientists as well, and they both take both modes of transportation. So the year that we went, there were over 37,000 tourists that went predominantly on a cruise ship. Um, there was a very small percentage of those tourists who went by airplane. Um, the scientists kind of split, they go mix of airplane as well as boat. And then there's a very small percentage of those 37,000 who go by private sailboat. And the year that we went, which was 2013, there were five private sailboats, which amounted to about 20 people. So out of 37,000 that went that year, there were only literally a handful of people who sailed kind of on their own to Antarctica. So, okay, cool, we need a boat. So, how do you get a boat? Well, our backgrounds are in sailing, and Fede's is not only in sailing, but the Merchant Marine. So, it was sort of a lifelong dream of his to build a boat. And in 2007, this is what our boat looked like. <laughs> so, these are the plates of steel that Fede started with to build the sailboat that we then called Quixote. So, 2007, that's the boat. Uh, Antarctica is seeming very far away. Um, here's the construction of the hull. Um, you might notice that it's upside down. And the reason for that is that for those big plates of steel, it's a lot easier to sort of place them and maneuver them than to try and lift them up. So, ideally, you want to build, the, or one of the ways to do it is to build it upside down. It's a bit easier for placing. And then once that bottom part of the hull is done, you can flip it around. Now you might notice that this doesn't really look like a shipyard. And that's because it's really a backyard. So this is someone's backyard in the middle of kind of the suburbs of Buenos Aires that Fede and his kind of team of motley men uh, took over and so everything they did was literally handmade so even this rig that they set up to flip the boat was all made by themselves. Um, so here they are flipping the boat and um, this is, there she is, kind of her hull and you might be patting yourself on the back at the moment because it looks like a boat. However, this is really where the hard work begins. This just takes about six or seven months, correct? But yeah. So six or seven months you're here, and now all of the hard work of the carpentry, the plumbing, electrical installation, the engine installation, that really begins. And in kind of the experience of Fede and ourselves, most people who set out to build kind of a larger boat get to here quite easily and then start to flounder. So here's Quixote with her hull, and then here's Fede doing some of the construction. So there he is in the engine room. We actually have an engine room on this boat. It's 12 meters, so a 40-foot sailboat, um, and steel, steel hulled. Um, and then there's the interior and Fede working. Now, since this is a talk about Antarctica and not a talk about boat construction, I'll skip, skip to the final construction uh, photos. But if you do have any questions about the construction, Fede, the master, is here. And we have a book as well that documents the construction of the boat. Um, so this is the boat, and the cool thing about Quixote is that literally it is Fede. All of his cool little quirky ideas are all here, and this is, if you're going to Antarctica in a boat this size, this is the boat you want to go in. Everything from a really large, beautiful pilot house, so you actually see things when you're inside, to spacious cabins and um, one of two heads or bathrooms. Um, 
This is Quixote on launch day, so this is her, in 2010. So that was actually a very quick build. So from 2007 until 2010, here she is nearly complete. And then by 2011, <coughs> everything was finished. Between here, there's obviously no mast, so by adding the mast, plus since this is a custom-built sailboat, we had to go through all of the paperwork and certification with the Coast Guard. So it took us another year, and Fede really pushing the Coast Guard, to get all of the certifications and inspections in place. So by 2011, we've got a sailboat, so problem number one of getting to Antarctica, solved. Mode of transportation. Quixote is built. The second thing you need to go to Antarctica is permission. So in the 1950s, uh, it became kind of apparent to the worldwide community that we have this pretty amazing continent there at the end of the world, but you know, people are claiming it, some are doing science, how are we going to deal with this continent that sits at the end of the world? And so in 1961, the Antarctic Treaty came into force, and that essentially declared that nobody owns Antarctica, although countries still do claim it, including the UK, Argentina, Chile, and Norway, and France. Um, so they basically said nobody owns it, and that we are going to set this aside as a place to do science. No one can do exploration for minerals there, and kind of recognizing that this is something special that we as a worldwide community need to preserve. Um, that did okay, um, but then in the early 90s it became apparent that we as a global community weren't doing particularly well at protecting the environment. Um, a lot of the countries were going in and building a lot of scientific bases, the British especially, they built tons all over the continent, and then they sort of abandon them and just leave rusty tin cans and rusty, I mean, just essentially the whole setup there to rot. And, um, and, so, and also, we weren't really interacting particularly well with um, the wildlife, and so there was suddenly this fear that we're going to destroy what we set out to preserve. Um, so at this point, one of the things that happened is any of you who have known the stories of say, Scott or Amundsen know that sled dogs were a big part of early Antarctic exploration. Well, at this point, they banned dogs down there because, you know, obviously dogs love to chase penguins and all sorts of other um, cool wildlife, and so dogs at this point were banned. But also what happened at this point is that anyone, be it our own sailboat trip, be it a cruise ship, or say even a climbing expedition, anyone who wanted to go to Antarctica needed to apply to their national... Antarctic organization, whatever that may be for the country. So each country then had to grant permission for any trip that wanted to go down there. And part of the application or the permit process had to be some form of environmental assess impact assessment. Now to be honest, each country does it differently. In Australia, you can click, it's all online. Um, for this trip, we applied via Argentina because the boat is flagged in Argentina and Fede is Argentinian. And in order to apply, we actually had to submit a 43-page environmental impact assessment that looked at uh, every single, every place that we thought we were going to go, what the activities we were going to do there, how we would impact it, what sort of prevention and mitigation measures we put in place, as well as our experience. And um, actually, the U.S. process is fairly similar. You apply uh, via the U.S. State Department, and they first determine whether you are kind of eligible to apply via the U.S., and then they farm you out to the NSF in order to submit a waste permit, and then to the EPA to do the same thing, an environmental impact assessment. Um, but again, every country does it a little bit differently. Um, some are easier than others. So we submitted this. To be honest, it was a bit of back and forth, plus a huge learning curve on our part in terms of environmental impact assessments. Um, but we finally got it agreed upon between us and the Argentine government, so we were good to go. So we've got a boat. We've got permission, and then the third kind of piece of the puzzle is experience. So Antarctica is obviously a fairly remote place, and not only do you need experience sailing, which for us was sailing our boat, as well as our own, our own backgrounds. Um, so Fede's experience started young. I think these were some early prototypes of Quixote. Uh, was that wax paper? Yeah. yeah. So there he is at a very young age, obviously with an interest in sailboats. Um, as I said, Fede then went on. He was so, he and his dad actually at the age of 12, so very similar to the age when I first started to get to know Kevin, um, went 
to a sailing school close to him. He grew up four blocks from the beach. And they also started out on Optimus Prams, the same as me, and then graduated to slightly bigger boats. And then he and his dad had caught the sailing bug and then purchased a fairly small boat, 20 feet, 20 feet boat, dragged the whole family along for um, adventures in the Rio de la Plata, which were better suited probably for larger boats. But the whole family got dragged along. He loved sailing so much that he went on to the Merchant um, Marine College, became a deck officer, and then went off sailing on a larger vessels around the world. In 2005, he took a break, kind of professionally, to do a bit more blue water sailing. And this is a boat, it's not Quixote, it's called Tango, and its owner had it in the Caribbean. It was an Argentine owner and he wanted to bring it back to Argentina. And believe it or not, the easiest way to sail a boat from the Caribbean down to Argentina, actually sailing, is to sail across to Europe or Northern Africa and then sail back down to Brazil and Argentina, given how the trade winds go there. So, yeah, you'd never guess that's the fastest way or easiest way. Um, so he and his brother got up to the Caribbean, jumped on the boat, and together, double-handed, sailed it from the Caribbean across to Northern Africa, to the... Kind of the to Canary Islands, um, and then to sail it back to Argentina, Fede sailed solo across the Atlantic, back down to Brazil, and then the coast down to Argentina and Buenos Aires. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so this trip was really formative for Fede in terms of building the boat as well as gaining skills um, on some pretty intense crossings. So there were a lot of things he learned on this trip that he did want to include when building Quixote, as well as a lot of things he didn't want to include when building Quixote, and especially things like things that are inaccessible when they go wrong. A lot of times on sailboats they install things and build everything else around it, so getting to the troubleshooting is nearly impossible. So, you know, you learn it the hard way, and when you build your own boat, you don't have to build it the way everyone else builds it, you can build it the smart way. And that's what Fede did, based on kind of his experience, a lot of it coming from Tango. As for myself, here's my beginnings right here, Kevin. <laughs> um, also, after that experience, actually during college, I spent some time crewing on some schooners up in Massachusetts. And then, as I said, I work on larger vessels, and the crew is actually quite small, so the scientific crew that I run, we get quite heavily involved in the operation of the boat. And in fact, I'm one of the coxswains or small boat drivers, so this is me driving our fast rescue boat somewhere on off the coast of West Africa. So I also had experience in some ways professionally and in like a very structured environment of um, working at sea. So we've got some personal experience, but since Quixote was new, we also wanted some experience with the boat. You don't just want to take a new boat straight down to Antarctica and discover all of those little surprises. So what we did is we decided to take a trip up the coast of South America, basically up here, um, up Brazil, and that took us, that was during the course of a southern winter or northern summer. Um, going up, the whole trip probably took us, what, four, five, six months, mm -hmm. uh, starting in Argentina, going along Uruguay, up the coast of Brazil, a lot of inter-island sailing near Rio de Janeiro, and then back down. And during those four or five months, we learned the boat a lot. And we also learned some things we needed to change. So in November of 2012, we got back to Buenos Aires, and Fede spent a month making a lot of modifications to the boat. Um, so here she is on her way back from Brazil. I mean, small modifications that you'll actually see when um, I show the video. Things like, um, for example, most of your sailboats have some sort of spray you know, hood here that's canvas. Well, that's now aluminum. So it's a hard top, you can stand on it, it's very well protected and very sturdy. Another thing you'll see in the video is that in Antarctica, you can't just, first of all, there's no marinas, there's no dock, so that's not going to happen. Um, the other thing is you can't just drop your anchor. And that's for two reasons. One is the bottom's not necessarily that great for holding, and the other is you want more than one thing holding you when those strong winds and ice come. So what you'll traditionally do is, and you'll see us doing is, you'll drop your anchor, but then you'll also run four lines to shore. So you'll run two lines off your bow and tie them to rocks, and then two lines off your stern. And those lines are about 300 feet long. Mm. And 
that can be a real pain to deal with all of that line or rope. So we've actually, since then, and you'll see it, installed two reels on the front and two reels on the stern. So you can very easily uh, deal with your rope. And you can talk to my mom and dad. They've had personal experience <laughs> dealing with some of that rope. And they were glad those reels existed. So great. So now we have a boat. We have permission. And we have experience. And actually, adding to that experience is uh, Fede was quite lucky because his maritime school in Argentina put on a two-week course on Antarctic navigation. It was by no means focused on sailboat owners. It was focused more on various navies and other larger vessels going down there. But he was able to attend and learned a lot um, in terms of various anchorages, weather patterns, tips and tricks. Um, so that even though we hadn't sailed to Antarctica, that greatly also added to kind of our experience base. So we have experience. So we've got all those three things. We're ready to go to Antarctica. So that was very exciting. So our trip was, we left the very end of January 2013. And um, essentially, it was a 35-day trip. And <coughs> with us, it was also sort of our honeymoon. Um, it was two of us plus two other friends. And there were some criteria, because if you're going for 35 days to Antarctica sailing, you need a bit of criteria. So the criteria for kind of the crew who went with us was one, they had to have some knowledge of sailing. To be honest, you didn't have to be able to single-handedly sail across the Atlantic, but you had to understand what was going on as well as be able to take some orders from fitting. Um, the, the second thing is you had to be able to take 35 days off because a lot of people obviously cannot take 35 days out of their schedule and come down to sail to Antarctica. And the final thing is we actually wanted to have to spend those 35 days with you, so you had to be someone that we uh, kind of sort of like could be in a confined space with. So we ended up going with uh, one friend from Sweden, and you'll see him. He's got red hair. He looks very much like a Viking, Eric. Um, and the other was an Argentinian woman who'd also built her own sailboat, and um, she came along as well. So I'm going to show you the video that we've put together about our expedition. Before I show you the video, though, there's just a, a few things I want to point out, so when you see them, you kind of notice them in the movie. And... Um, so just so the overview of the trip is going to be, in the movie you'll see smaller scale maps, but we start here, Ushuaia is what we now, where we now call home, and that's in Tierra del Fuego on the Beagle Channel. This is the Drake Passage, some of you may have heard of it, and it's quite famous because the waters are pretty much horrible, all of the winds kind of funnel in through the west, and um, as you'll see in the movie we actually have to wait for weather because there's usually some weather windows of about three or four days, and it takes about four and a half days to sail across. So we're constantly watching the weather, and we actually delayed our departure a bit to get that weather window. Once we get down there, we basically sail in and around these islands here, down on the peninsula. But the first thing you need to know about the movie is our very first stop is a place called Deception Island, that round bit there, this is taken from Google Maps, Deception Island. Now, nature is pretty interesting and things aren't just round for, a re for without reason. And the reason this is very round in such an odd way is that it's a volcano. And believe it or not, it's actually an active volcano. It's erupted about three or four times in the past hundred years. And in fact, it kind of wiped out one of the scientific stations that was there. So, when you first see us approaching, the reason I want to mention it is that when it's at eye level, you don't really get the sense that it's a volcano. But when you see it here, it's pretty obvious. So the cool thing is you'll see that there's this little opening here called Neptune's Bellows. And we sail into there. And we actually spent about three or four days just inside of Deception Island. And you'll also see us enjoying some geothermally heated activities. Um, the other thing that you... One, I've got four things you should know. Deception Island is a volcano, is number one. Um, the other is, let me go back a bit, um, when, you, when you're in Antarctica, you pretty much want to avoid sailing at night. All of you have seen, heard about, or read about the Titanic, boats, icebergs, together, <laughs> not a good thing. So once you pretty much get in this area, you have a risk of hitting icebergs. And once you're down in here, you've got a very high risk of hitting icebergs. So. You, it, you can detect them on the radar, but it's quite difficult, to be honest. And so basically you don't want to sail at night. Now, yes, there's those of you out there telling me you're in Antarctica, Laura, so there's no night. And But no, if you go in January, December, yes, that's true, around the summer solstice. But we were there in February, so there were about four to five hours of night 
during our trip. So there was times of darkness where you can't really see what's out there. So it's pretty hard not to sail at night when you're crossing. So you kind of have to cross your fingers as you get closer that you're not going to hit anything. But once you're there, our goal was not to sail at night. However, you'll see in the movie, um, there was this one day where we sailed and we had a destination in mind. We thought it was going to be a safe anchorage. We got there and it's filled with ice. So all of the potential places, we kind of scouted around and they were gone. And we'd been sailing all day. We got there around about 7 in the evening. By the time we'd scouted and kind of admitted to ourselves that it wasn't going to be good, it was around 9 o'clock. So we only had about two more hours of light. Unfortunately, the next place that was potentially safe was at least six hours away. So what do you do? So we had our brainstorming session, and the solution was, and you'll see it in the video, was, okay, we've got two hours. Let's go while we still have light. And luckily, where we were going was fairly open water until you got there. So let's go for two hours. Then let's just sh shut everything off, sails, engine, and drift. So, and we'll do watches. So the idea is, A, if you're drifting and you kind of go to bed and there's nothing, then hopefully there's nothing. And also, um, even if you do scrape or come by something, you're not going at high impact, you know, you're gonna just brush it or whatever. And we did shifts and we did monitor the radar and, and that worked. So you will see that come up. Um, the other thing you should know is, you know, let's face it, National Geographic, Discovery, our photos, 